Uh, today we are going to begin with the last topic of this uh, course, namely input output subsystem. We have so far talked about processor and memory. Processor is the central component of the entire system uh, where the programs are executed. Memory is essential in order to hold the program and data on which uh, some uh, instructions operate. And uh, input output is important to connect the computer to the rest of the world. So, if you do not have any means of input and output, no information can enter uh, the memory or the processor and no information can come out. So, this is essential to make it useful because uh, after all computation involves that you have some data you process and produce the results. So, ultimately you need input and output. We are going to look at various aspects of input output subsystem. Uh, we will talk about performance considerations. Uh, particularly of I O system. We will talk of peripheral devices which are the extremities of a computer system uh, where the data gets transformed into a form which is uh, understandable by uh, others. It could be human, it could be the environment or uh, the information is brought in the form which is understood outside into the computer in form of uh, uh, ones and zeros. Then we will talk about uh, interfaces and the buses. These are the means to connect the input output uh, devices or peripherals to rest of the system. And finally, we will uh, look at the operational aspect how IO or input output is actually carried out. So, our focus today would be on the first two aspects. Uh, IO performance uh, is a contributor to the overall performance, but it often gets neglected. Uh, one would talk of uh, speeding up the processor, executing more and more instruction at any time, making access to memory fast. But if you neglect I/O, uh, your uh, benefit of performance improvements may not really be fully effective. So consider, for example, that you have some benchmark program which takes 100 seconds in all, out of which uh, the CPU consumes 90 percent of the time and uh, 10 percent of the time is taken for IO. That means, the data is brought in, results are sent out and uh, we know that by technological innovations, uh, the speed of processor is continuously improving and uh, if we have 50 percent improvement every year. So, over a period of 5 years, we, we could see that this 90 seconds which uh, the CPU consumed would get reduced to 60, 40, 27, 18 and 12 leading to an overall improvement by a factor of 7 and a half times. Uh, now, on the other hand suppose I O performance remains unchanged, then what is the effect of this on the overall performance? So, the total time uh, is uh, what we have for the CPU and 10 seconds of the I O remain unchanged, so, the, the, the total figure would be 100 next year it goes to 70, next year it goes to 50 and so on and uh, finally, we have 22 after 5 years. So, now if you look at the ratio of 122, it is only a 4.5 times improvement. So, uh, not improving I O performance could bring down your expected performance improvements. Uh, so, so this, this was a case where the program is computation bound. A computation bound means that majority of the time is taken in performing computations, arithmetic, logic, decision and so on and uh, there is a comparatively much smaller amount of I O. On the other hand, there are situations which are I O bound, where process processing is very little, it is uh, essentially uh, input and output. If you, if you look at uh, scientific computation, uh, let us say weather prediction or uh, nuclear modeling and so on, here I O is very little and most of the time it is number crunching or uh, heavy computation, but uh, in business data processing uh, or, or database oriented application, it it is uh, often most of the time gets spent in input and output. So, uh, if if the let us say ratios were reversed and it is only 10 percent part which you are improving, then obviously, there is not much improvement which gets done. So, it uh, it is important to take care of I O performance improvement also. Uh, in order to improve the overall performance. Now, the next question is how do you define I O performance? 
what do we mean by IO performance? Uh, as we saw in case of CPU, depending upon your perspective, your requirement, uh, they, they may be a different definition of what is IO performance. It could be a throughput oriented measure, that means uh, uh, how much of input output gets done, how much of data transfer gets done per unit time. Uh, one could talk of amount of data transfer in unit time like kilobytes per second or megabytes per second or you could talk of number of I O operations per unit time. Okay. Each I O operation may involve some transfer, it could be small, it could be few bytes, it could be few kilobytes and we, we want to uh, let us say maximize how many such uh, transfers take place. On the other hand, uh, uh, it may be the response time which is important. So, fr from the time you, uh, you take some action, you give a command and uh, uh, it takes to respond to that. So, there, there may be environments where that may be more important. There could also be cases where both are important. Okay. For example, if you take a reservation system for railways or airlines. So, as, as a user, as an individual user, uh, you, you want uh, your job to be done as fast as possible. Once your requirements are fed in, you want the system to respond immediately. So, uh, response of course, would involve computation as well as input output. On the other hand, uh, in, if you look at the whole system, then, then there is a central database somewhere, where uh, requests are uh, being sent in and it is responding. So, so at that point, at, at the point of the central database, uh, it is a throughput of I O, uh, which might become bottleneck and, and you may be uh, trying to improve that. So, uh, at different, in different parts of the system or with different perspectives, the uh, con consideration for I O performance may be different. So, if, if your uh, interest is in let us say total time the program takes to execute, right? as we had uh, seen uh, for processor, then uh, clearly you can divide the total time between the time which uh, is taken for execution for computation and the time for taking in the data or sending out the data. Uh, so, now based on these considerations, suppose you look at a supercomputing application or typically uh, scientific application, there uh, you, uh, it, it may be typically a computation bound application, but uh, there also may be at time lot of results or simulation results which may have to be printed out. So, here it is not the response time, but again the data throughput which is important. So, which may be measured in kilobytes or megabytes per second. Uh, transaction processing for example, let us say ATM, bank ATM. So, here uh, uh, transaction per second uh, is important from the overall system point of view and again uh, for a person when you uh, feed in a request for drawing some money, you want it to respond immediately. So, response time and transactions per second both are important. Uh, take example of a file server, suppose you have a cluster of computers as we have in our department and uh, th there is one of the machines which is acting as a file server where your homes are there. Okay. So, this, this file server would receive requests for creating files, opening files, reading, writing and so on. Each, each such request uh, is essentially an I O operation. Okay. So, uh, your, your concern would be how many I O operations the system is able to sustain and uh, that could be uh, one thing you may like to look at. So, so depending upon uh, situation, you, you may describe your uh, uh, I O consideration, I O, I O performance in a in terms of uh, some, some operations or some data transfer per second or in terms of time it takes to respond to you or some combination of both. Uh, while talking of I O performance, uh, one must keep in mind that often there could be a discrepancy in terms of units. If, when we have been talking of memory, we, we talk of K B, M B and so on. Once again here we are talking of kilobytes per second, megabytes per second, uh, but typically when you talk of memory size, uh, you, you mean uh, 1 kilobyte uh, as 1024 bytes or 2 raise power 10. Similarly, 1 megabyte is uh, 1024 kilobytes or uh, 1048576 bytes, which are basically 
this is power of 2 uh, 10th power of 2 and uh, I think this should have been 20th this is 20th power of 2 okay whereas in io uh, you you are talking of uh, thousands and millions in in the real sense so 1 kb per second here is 1000 bytes per second or 10 to the power 3 and similarly 1 megabyte per second is 1000 kilobytes per second or 1 million bytes per second so uh, approximately they are same okay but somewhere if you want to be a little more accurate one must keep in mind that uh, uh, there may be a di difference you know the language one is talking in memory domain or in processor domain may be different from what you are talking of in IO domain. So, uh, this is just a word of caution. <coughs> so, now let us uh, move towards uh, uh, peripheral devices before we do that let us look at the overall uh, system how we uh, conceive a stored program computer typically. So, this is a classical block diagram showing 5 units of a computer uh, which probably you would have seen in your uh, school days also. So, you have control arithmetic memory input and output right and uh, they are connected to each other. So, control and arithmetic uh, or uh, the, the data path as we mentioned here uh, these form the central processing unit or the central processor. So, we are talking of this part which is input and output all right. Uh, elaborating it further uh, this is how the picture looks like. Uh, I am also bringing in uh, two levels of memory hierarchy here. There is a cache memory and main memory and uh, the interconnection I am not showing point to point here unlike in the previous diagram. Here uh, we have put it as some, uh, some something in between the, the processor memory and the IO. Okay. What, what is shown at the bottom is the all IO subsystem and uh, somehow they are interconnected. We will elaborate on this uh, in subsequent lectures, uh, but notice here that <coughs> there are two things involved here in I O subsystem. They are I O devices or peripheral devices okay, and there are I O controllers which, uh, which sit between these devices and rest of the system. So, a, a controller may be taking care of multiple devices also. So, that possibility is also shown or a controller may take care of a single device. So, so we need to understand uh, what these devices and controllers are and uh, we will uh, have some discussion on this today and in subsequent lectures we will talk of how these get connected. So, uh, we will talk of buses and uh, uh, other means of connection and then finally, we will talk of how information goes across between uh, processor and these devices or memory and these devices. Okay. So, we will focus now our attention on devices and controller. So, uh, you, you may often not see these as separate things. Okay. Uh, physically, the controller and the device may be all packaged together. So, so roughly speaking, the device is the, the actual transducer, so to say, which converts information from one form to other form. Okay. So, let us say printer, you send it some bits and bytes, at some point it is getting converted to a printed page. Uh, but, but there is something between uh, uh, the, the processor and buses on one hand and uh, and this printing mechanism. So, there, there is a controller which, which takes care of movement of data, sometime even conversion of data in some form. So, uh, there is a wide variety of peripheral devices and you can try to classify them in many different ways. So, you, you could uh, for example, talk about their behavior in terms of whether they uh, input that means, bring information into processor and memory combination or take information out or play both the roles. Okay. So, so, that is one aspect. Uh, so, for example, keyboard is an input device, printer is an output device. Uh, the second issue is who is the partner with whom are these devices trying to communicate or uh, with whom uh, do these devices make processor talk to. So, uh, it could be at the other end there could be a human programmer, human operator or there could be another computer, another machine or the devices 
could let a computer talk to the environment in general not a, neither a machine nor uh, a human being or <coughs> they could be simply uh, some kind of internal devices in the sense that they only store information disk right for example right so, so so let me give example of each of these uh, keyboard is for example for uh, human uh, operators okay uh, network controller will connect one machine to other machine uh, environment uh, th that is typically in an embedded domain, you, you could have a, a sensor for example, sensing temperature or a computer trying to turn a motor. Uh, storage example is uh, disk drive. Then thirdly, uh, they could be characterized in terms of the kind of data uh, which is moving across in terms of either its speed some devices are very slow, some are very fast, some could be medium. Of course, this is very uh, coarse classification. One could specify the rate of transfer, okay, how many bytes or kilobytes or megabytes getting uh, the device is capable of transferring. So, uh, depending upon how you organize the whole system, uh, that capability may not be met, may be met or may not be met. So, suppose uh, there is a disk which is capable of transferring data at the rate of 10 megabytes per second. Uh, you have to organize rest of your system so that this uh, ca capacity gets utilized. If you do not, uh, this may be ready to transfer data, but you may not be willing to take it. Uh, how, how much of data gets transferred in, in one chunk, one <coughs> quantum? So, it could be serial data, which means the information goes bit by bit okay, as, as it goes on the network, for example or it could be parallel data, which, which may be 8 bits, 16 bits or uh, could be larger size. How it is encoded? Okay. So, so if you have uh, 8 bits going, what does uh, one group of 8 bit means? So, so, different devices may have different kind of encoding and uh, the whole variety exists there. Uh, now, b before we talk of uh, the current situation, uh, le let me recall uh, how uh, a set of peripheral devices look like uh, uh, years ago. So, so this is a story. Of, this is a picture of uh, IIT Delhi, which I am trying to uh, paint uh, when uh, I was exposed to the computer for the first time. So we we had uh, not in the present position. There was a, a computer called ICL 1909 it was uh, somewhere on ERF floor and uh, the only devices, only peripheral devices it had was a paper tape reader and paper tape punch. Uh, uh, the paper tape basically was uh, it is a strip of paper with holes punched on it and a uh, group of holes form one character. So, uh, the, the way one could input information was to use a device called uh, a typewriter devi device typewriter like device called flexorator. Basically, could think of a typewriter with, with a uh, uh, sort of spool of tape attached at the end at one end. So, as, as you type information could be punched on that and similarly, if you run a punch tape, it could also print out on, on a sheet of paper. So, uh, as far as uh, computer is concerned, the directly connected peripherals were paper tape reader and paper tape punch. So, uh, everything uh, was in the form of paper tape, the operating system, the compiler, uh, the, the user program, the, the library. So, everything had to be fed one by one and finally, you will uh, your results will be punched on paper tape and uh, so, so there is a larger room uh, roughly of this size and a smaller room. In the smaller room, there were couple of these uh, typewriter like devices where you could uh, prepare your programs and when results come back, you 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 uh, print them out here. So, uh, of course, a uh, uh, couple of years later, the uh, additional devices were introduced, magnetic tape, where uh, program and data could be stored for repeated use and this was of course, much faster. Uh, the, the paper tape was just, uh, the reader was a little faster, something like 300 character per second, punch was only some 10, 20 character per second and a line printer. So, li line printer uh, was something like uh, 
I think 300 lines uh, per minute. So, it could print one line at a time. So, so that made life a little easier and subsequently uh, uh, tape got replaced by punched cards and at, at that time the system also moved to the current location. So, punch card have advantage that it is like a deck of cards each card basically is one one line of your program okay one, one statement so if you want to edit you could take out a few cards and you could put back uh, new cards you you could, you could uh, edit your program like that uh, you can't change a card but, but you in in the deck you can take out a few cards you can insert a few cards of course editing in uh, paper tape environment uh, was uh, much much more painful you have to cut the tape and patch it with uh, something okay uh, another piece so obviously it's not surprising that people uh, uh, some people could uh, you know look at the tape and read it uh, look look through the punch holes uh, disk drive was uh, again uh, added convenience which was of course much faster than uh, tape the tape goes absolutely serially whereas in in uh, disk you can reach a particular track and then of course within a track you are sequential but uh, you you can uh, you do not have to go from one track to other track by going through one track completely. The tape is entirely sequential, uh, but the disk capacity of those days was something like uh, 20 megabytes was a, was a big uh, figure. Uh, obviously, because mem memory was uh, 32 kilobytes or 64 kilobytes of that order. Okay, so, now we fast forward into the modern era we have whole variety of peripherals and uh, le let me list some of these uh, with uh, the kind of classification we did earlier. So, let us look at the peripherals you have for interaction with human beings, okay, human programmer operator. So, the important thing here is to uh, I mean you I am sure you are familiar with all the names which I am putting here, uh, but it is important at this stage to get a feel of what kind of data rate or throughput rate uh, these peripherals are dealing with okay, because when you design a complete IO system you should have a feel of these things. So, uh, devices like keyboard and mouse uh, are, are limited by uh, the, the rate at which you can type. So, it is only a fraction of kilobytes or basically a few bytes per second is uh, the rate at which you can feed information and, and that is what you require. So, uh, I, I mean these are designed to take care of let us say the fastest uh, typist, we do not need anything faster here. Uh, you see here voice input and voice output. So, uh, the, the trend is towards uh, developing these type of capabilities voice input, voice output, uh, pictorial input, pictorial output. Uh, which are which are more natural to human being. I mean, instead of typing, if you can talk to computer, it is definitely much nicer. But it is not just a issue of peripheral device. It is also a matter of the recognition of uh, what is being spoken or generating speech output. So we are not worrying about. We are not concentrating on that part. Uh, but the the voice input, uh, voice would be uh, digitized and uh, brought to the computer in the form of a sequence of samples. So, of course, the, the figures given here, uh, these are from our textbook are uh, 0 0.02 kilobytes per second or uh, uh, 20 bytes per second. Now, th this is a uh, this is the rate of information uh, if, if it is compressed. But uh, typically, the speech uh, inputs are sampled at least at uh, a rate of 10 kilo 10 samples per second. And if each sample is uh, a, uh, one byte, so it has to be at least uh, 10 kilobytes per second, not not 20 bytes per second. <coughs> and similarly, uh, a plain speech would be uh, again typically sampled 8 to 10 kilobytes per second. Uh, if you are talking of music output that is sampled at much higher rate. So, typically for in the range of 40, 50 uh, 
1000 samples per second or so many kilobytes per second. Uh, then another input device is a scanner which can basically scan uh, a text or image whatever is there on sheet of paper and uh, de depending upon the, the size and the resolution uh, you, you may have different data rates. So, uh, the, the resolution or the accuracy is here measured in terms of uh, dots per inch or DPI. So, so you, you have scanners which are uh, 600 DPI or 1200 DPI and so on. That, that means, uh, uh, how closely or how finely the information can be resolved. So, if this DPI value is lower, then you will get a uh, very uh, sort of coarse picture. Uh, if, if you have higher DPI, then, then you get a finer sharper picture. Uh, you have a variety of output devices, line printers, laser printers, uh, graphic display. Uh, as you would notice, graphic display is a highly demanding uh, peripheral. Okay. So, it is known as 60,000 kilobytes per second or 60 megabytes per second. Why is it, is it so high? Because it again depends upon the, the resolution. O on a screen, suppose uh, roughly speaking, suppose you have 1000 by 1000 pixels. So, uh, it could be more accurately 1024 by 760 or whatever. So, so as an approximate calculation, suppose you have 1 million pixels on the screen. Uh, then the question is how, how much, how many bits are required to represent each pixel. So, you you would have seen color settings. So, uh, it you could use one byte to represent one pixel. So, or you have 24 bits in, in uh, if you are going for a good quality. So, that means 3 bytes per pixel okay. and uh, 1 million pixel means uh, 3 million bytes is the information present on screen. And for, uh, uh, for a persistent display, uh, this needs to be repeated, refreshed, so that you, you get a persistent picture. So, the rate of repetition could be something like uh, 25 uh, frames per second or 50 frames per second or 60 frames per second. So, so if, you, if you take that into account, uh, you, you realize that it is a really heavily, highly demanding uh, peripheral device. <coughs> Then you have a variety of uh, peripheral devices which connect a computer to a network of computers. So, so you have uh, various kinds of modems. Okay. They, they could be fax modem, uh, cable modem. Cable modem connects to uh, a TV, video cable. Okay. Fax modem connects to a telephone line. ADSL modem also connects to a telephone line, uh, which is capable of carrying digital information. Uh, on the other hand, you could have uh, LAN adapters, local area network adapters, wired or wireless. So, so these could be, uh, th these are typically input and output both okay. and the data rates uh, for LANs are higher uh, depending upon whether it is a, a 10 megabits per second LAN or 100 megabits per second LAN or 1 gigabits per second LAN. So, these are the three common standards. Uh, so, so many bits per second can be easily translated into bytes per second by reducing one order for example. Uh, these similarly, you have modems uh, in a wide variety of speeds. Uh, the, the, the slowest one would be a fax modem which works on telephone lines. So, typically they are 56 kilobytes, 56 kilobits per second. Uh, you might have heard the term BOD, B A U D. So, baud is same thing as bits per second. It is a unit used in terms of communication uh, specifying the rate in terms of bits per second. So, 56 kilo baud or 56 kilo bits per second. Example of uh, peripheral devices for storage, uh, floppy disk drive, optical disk or CD-ROM and DVDs. Okay, their storage is in the form of optical. So, uh, on a disk you have uh, portions which are uh, opaque which are uh, portion which are transparent and 
depending upon how finely you can resolve, how closely you can space uh, the, the op, uh, opaque regions and transparent regions, you will get more bits per uh, unit area. And uh, uh, that will also determine how, how much of data can be read out as uh, the medium moves. <coughs> Magnetic tape, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they are sequential devices. So, information is stored from one end to other end in a serial form and they are for archival purpose for long term storage, where you are not reading and writing very often. Uh, among these disks are the fastest. Okay. As you can see that uh, the data rates could be uh, varying from something like 100 kilobytes per second of floppy drive to uh, as much as 10,000 kilobytes per second or 10 megabytes per second of uh, hard disk drive. Uh, another uh, memory you can add to this list is, uh, is these uh, flash memories or, or, or the pen drive, USB drive, the kind which on which I am carrying my lecture and plugged into uh, the USB port. So, so these are there is no moving part in that. It's basically uh, a semiconductor memory, which, which is uh, non-volatile type. It's called flash memory, and uh, uh, it is comparatively uh, what would be the transfer rate? I think it will be. Uh, it it is uh, it's slightly slower than magnetic disk. Okay, I do not have the exact figure. Uh, Let us look little bit uh, deeper into some of the peripherals. Uh, so, this is a schematic of a hard disk drive. Uh, so, basically it it is a it is a group of rotating media platters as they are called. Uh, this picture shows two platters. Okay, so, so, these are rotating disks where on the surface information is stored. Uh, each platter typically is capable of storing information on both sides. Okay, so, uh, you can there, there is some coating which is magnetically sensitive and it is on, on that uh, 1 and 0 get stored in the form of polarity of magnetization. So, there is a uh, uh, there is a set of read write heads which are mounted on an arm. Uh, here it is pivoted uh, on this uh, and it, it rotates around this. So, by that uh, rotation this end which is the head can move closer to the center or move towards the circumference towards the periphery. Uh, so, you, you have uh, circular tracks on the disk. Okay very closely spaced circular tracks and uh, these heads get positioned over uh, some track. So, uh, all these heads move together. So, so uh, at one point of time, let us say uh, all the heads are positioned on track 1 of uh, that particular uh, platter, then you, you move them, they could be positioned on, all of them get positioned on their uh, track number 10 and so on. So, so, there is a movement of head from track to track and the movement of disk is rotary. So, if you need to reach some point in the uh, uh, some, some information which is stored somewhere here, then uh, this part has to rotate and come in contact with the head and head also effectively this moves radially and uh, it has to get position at that, po that point. So, once that is done the information can be recorded or read out. Okay. So, so this is a real picture of a uh, hard disk drive. Uh, so, so here you can see four platters. Okay, so there will be eight surfaces, eight recording surfaces, and uh, this is the head. This is the head assembly, and the uh, this is, sorry, this is the arm and the head is actually close to the tip. So, uh, it is uh, pivoted around this point and uh, so, so this head will move outside outwards or inwards move from track to track.
the rotational speeds are typically uh, uh, they, they, they follow certain standards. So, uh, standards these uh, keep changing uh, 3600 revolutions per minute or from that it changed to 5400 revolutions per minute or 7200 revolutions per minute. Uh, this example is of 15.3 thousand or 15,300 revolutions per second. So, example of uh, disk from Seagate. So, uh, 15 point 15 k is the uh, highest speed you find these days commercially, and uh, th that that decides how fast you can get the data. Okay, uh, it, it influences both the time it takes to reach the initial point and the time to transfer. Okay, Be when the disk is rotating, uh, once you have positioned the head at the right point, uh, the the rate at which it rotates. Uh, determine the rate at which you are encountering the data and that is the rate of transfer. Uh, this has total capacity of uh, 73 GB, speed is 50 k rpm, uh, seek time, seek time is uh, the, the time to reach the desired point which could be more or which could be uh, small. So, if, if you are already close to that it may take less time, if you are sitting far away then it may take more time. So, 3.6 is average. Uh, the, the interface also uh, follows certain standard and this standard is called ultra 320 SCSI. We will talk of these little more, little more later and this is characterized by the rate of transfer 320 megabytes per second. So, so this is the rate sustained by the interface. Uh, that, that on that interface depending upon what disk you connect and what speed it is rotating at. Uh, you you will have actual data generated at a different rate. So, so this is not an example of uh, very high capacity disk, but a fast disk. The next one is uh, somewhat slower about half the speed, uh, but capacity is larger. So, capacity uh, I think it will come on the next one. So, this is a uh, 250 GB disk. Okay. 8 MB uh, buffer size, which means uh, uh, the, the data does not go to uh, the processor of memory directly, it is first brought into a local memory which is of size 8 megabytes okay, and then from there it is transferred. Average latency, uh, this is a rotational latency. So, uh, the, the, the time to reach a particular point is determined by uh, two things one is the time taken for rotation and second is time for the head to go from one track to other track. right? So, uh, the, the rotational latency in this case is 4.2 milliseconds and uh, this can be determined if you take the rpm figure how many revolutions per minute, you can find the time for one revolution and if you take half of that, that is typically taken as the average uh, rotational latency. Okay? So, if you do that arithmetic you will get 4.2 milliseconds. Uh, the, the seek time is uh, okay. You can look at this here. Track to track seek time is moving from one track to other track is two milliseconds, and uh, uh, this, this is if you were to move one track only. But on the average, there's some average figure given. It is uh, for reading 8.9 milliseconds and writing 10.9 milliseconds. So, so basically, uh, the, the time involved. To, to reach the first piece of data is uh, of the order of several milliseconds okay. and uh, the time to transfer the data is much faster. Once you reach that point, then things are faster. Uh, so, so, this is buffer to disk transfer time between disk and the buffer. Uh, this is 737 megabits per second maximum. This is dependent upon the rotational speed. Okay and buffer to host, uh, here it is a different interface EIDE, uh, in the previous there was a different interface, this takes uh, 100 megabytes per second. So, here uh, the, the peak of the transfer between disk and buffer is much higher, uh, but what happens is that uh, the, the disk is not always busy in transferring, it is at time busy in seeking also. So, so th therefore, uh, this is this figure is okay. Uh, initially one might think that disk is faster, but you have arranged for a 
slower interface but but disk cannot be continuously seeking it it has to so it disk is not continuously transferring it uh, in between it spends time in moving to uh, the desired point so so continuing uh, with that uh, there are some parameter which define the storage layout uh, cylinder is actually a, a collection of all the tracks which are uh, sort of coinciding on different platters. So, suppose you have four platters on uh, you talk of tenth track on each of these. So, all these together will form uh, what is called a cylinder. So, of often uh, you do not write in terms of number of tracks you talk of total number of cylinders. So, this is one figure the total number of heads uh, each surface is accessed by a different head. Uh, then number of each track is divided into number of sectors. Well, this is from the western digital internet site, but I think there is a there is something wrong in this figure because it does not tell you the rest. Uh, number of sectors per track typically are few hundreds. Uh, total capacity is 250 GB, uh, bytes per sector is 512, so half kilobyte is each. Uh, Let us, uh, so this, this was uh, one of the very important peripheral device the disk. Uh, well, sometime it is not considered as an I O device, uh, some people try to characterize this as a storage device, okay, but all the same the, the way uh, processor and memory have to communicate with disk is something like an I O device. Uh, this is an example of an L C D monitor. Uh, from Samsung, different views are shown. Uh, interesting thing is this view, which shows how, how thin it is. Okay. Unlike, uh, uh, well, this is also LCD monitor. Uh, if you have CRT monitors, which are very bulky, <coughs> so you can get some idea of uh, the resolution here. So, the one shown in the picture is really very high resolution 1920 into 1200 and uh, the viewing angle. Okay. So, often LCD monitors uh, may have limited viewing angle you know if you look from side you may have problem in seeing, but this one is 170 degrees. So, it is you can see almost 180. Then uh, these are wireless LAN adapters. Okay, uh, so so this one is uh, one which connects to a USB. USB is a serial bus. We will uh, talk of these terms a little more later. And th so so this connects externally to a computer. This goes inside the computer. This is this connects to a PCI bus. Again, we'll talk of this term a little later. Uh, graphics card. So, th these are the card which drive really high resolution monitors and can uh, they are able to show you uh, changing scenes very conveniently. Scanners, scanners are characterized by their uh, resolution in DPI as I mentioned. So, 1200 DPI, uh, the number of colors they can resolve. So, 48 bit color 6 bytes. Uh, the, these scanners have a document feeder attached that means, you can put a bunch of papers and they can uh, uh, automatically feed like a photocopying machine if you have seen one with a feeder. Uh, inkjet printers they are very cost effective and uh, quality is continuously improving. Uh, they are also characterized by the number of dots per inch that that is the printing quality and the number of colors they can resolve. Uh, so, so, I do not have those figures here. Mm. Uh, the, these have a direct network interface, so, so that it can be shared over a network. Uh, well, I am sorry for this 
picture, but idea was to show you a little close up of an inkjet printing uh, printer mechanism. Uh, if you can see here so in this one, uh, the paper gets fed from the top and goes through this area where printing gets done and then moves out here. Uh, there are ink cartridges here and the, the, the key thing here is this ink cartridge, okay, the, the crucial mechanism is sitting here. Rest of it is essentially paper feed and, uh, and movement of this and the interface. But uh, the, the new technological breakthroughs which have happened over last couple of years are in this. So, how uh, ink, very fine drops of ink can be uh, uh, thrown on paper to form uh, high quality pictures. So, so they are typically, uh, they are generally two techniques, one is a piezoelectric mechanism and other is a, a thermal system. So, to understand uh, this, we will just quickly take a minute here. So, so this is a ink cartridge where in this chamber there is ink and here is a uh, plate, quartz plate which is piezoelectric and uh, it can vibrate and by uh, that vibration it can throw out a very tiny, very fine, finely controlled droplet of ink. Uh, so, so this vibration would be controlled by uh, the electrical signal which it receives depending upon the information which is to be printed. And another view is that uh, again same thing, this is the chamber where ink is and a droplet gets thrown by this uh, vibration of piezoelectric uh, disc here. This is a thermal mechanism where uh, the ink droplet is thrown out by a small by very localized heating process. So, here uh, there is a heating resistor which gets uh, which gets heated by electrical current and uh, it is very controlled heating. So, by heating there is an expansion and a droplet goes out. So, uh, you remember that we are talking of uh, resolutions of the nature of 1200 dots per inch. So, you can imagine the the amount of the, the, the level of control which you have to have on uh, this ink droplet to make it printed. So, uh, just contrast it with the, the technology of peripheral devices which existed couple of decades back and where we are now. Okay, let me close at this point, uh, just to summarize, we talked of uh, I O performance consideration, they are important, briefly we talked about throughput type of I O definition, I O performance definition or response time type of definition. Uh, we looked at variety of peripherals, try to classify from different counts, uh, try to get a feel of their data transfer rates and we looked at a few examples of peripherals in little more details. In the next few lecture, we will talk of how they get interfaced to rest of the system. Thank you.